Amen. Boy, baptisms are habit forming here at the Grenape Church. Amen? Amen. And uh, we just love to see the, the Word of God transform lives and spread and increase. Welcome. I want to welcome any who are visiting in, in particular. Every week we're out in the foyer. We meet people that are coming from different parts of the country. They're either passing through. They say, we wanted to stop and worship with you here at the Hilltop Church, and we want to welcome you. And then always we have friends who are watching around the world online. Uh, some are watching the program live. Some are watching the archive program. And then we have online members who have no church they can go to. And they're one of our online members. We welcome you as well. A newly promoted lieutenant in the Army was transferred to uh, a new base. And he knew, nobody there would really know him, but he wanted to make a big impression. So the first day that he got set up in his new office, he had made up his mind that when some private knocked on his door and came in, he'd have the phone in his hand and he'd pretend he was talking to the, the general. And so sure enough, a private knocks on the door and he picks up the receiver of the phone and he says, come in. And the private comes in and stands there. He says, yes, sir, general, absolutely, general. I'm glad you have confidence in me, general. It'll be taken care of. And he hangs up. Sorry, private, I'm busy. What do you need? He said, well, sir, I'm here to hook up the telephone. <laughs> the Bible says a haughty spirit goes before a fall. Today we are continuing... A series we actually started a few weeks ago and we took a break for some of the, the holidays, but we're continuing with our series, The Sin That Conquers Kings. This would be part two. Proverbs 6, verse 16. Six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. First thing he mentions, a proud look, a lying tongue, Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are running to evil, and a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. Six things the Lord hates. It says he hates these things, and the first he mentions is pride. Now last week when we talked about the sin that conquers kings, and we figured that if it conquers kings, then we need to be careful. If it can take down a king, then can it take down you? We talked about Nebuchadnezzar. Remember the very successful, very intelligent king in uh, Sabbath school just a few moments ago. Pastor Ross was reviewing the same story because that's just where we are in our study of Daniel. And uh, it says that when Nebuchadnezzar got his wits up again after being crazy for seven years, it says his counselors came to, to seek his counsel. And Nebuchadnezzar is the one who tested the wise men in the early time, a very bright king. He trusted in his wisdom, trusted in his accomplishments, said, is this not the great Babylon that I have built for my majesty, my glory? Then he lost his mind. Anything you're proud of, you can lose it in a moment. Anything you have is a gift from God, your creator. For you to be proud of it when you really think about it is pretty silly because you didn't really do it. And you can't do anything without God. Now, as we continue looking at some of the kings that are vignettes that help us understand this principle of pride, we're going to go next to King Saul, a very interesting character study. King Saul was uh, technically the first king of Israel, the United Kingdom. You have three kings. There was briefly a king during the time of Judges called Abimelech. He didn't last long, and he wasn't recognized by all the tribes. But King Saul is really the first king. It's interesting, I think I've mentioned this before, that the first three kings that reigned over the United Kingdom before it divided Saul, who reigned 40 years, then David, who reigned 40 years, and then Solomon, who reigned 40 years. And as it turns out, all of them had problems with pride. Saul, I want to read you in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 17. Samuel the prophet said to Saul, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not chosen to be head of the tribes of Israel? 
And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? When you were little in your own eyes. Some of you remember that for years there were judges over Israel. And, um, but then the people said, we want to be like the other nations. We want a king. We don't want just the, the Lord to be our king. We want a king that will lead us into battle like the other nations. By the way, when the church starts saying, we want to be like the others, be like the world, then you're in trouble. And um, so God said, okay, I've, I've chosen a king. And when uh, Samuel first saw Saul, he was impressed because he was a head and shoulders taller than everybody else. And um, seemed to have a lot going for him. He was humble in the beginning. Matter of fact, when they went to anoint him king, they had to find him because he was hiding. But you know, he was king for 40 years. He started out humble. Pride is something that can catch up with you. And as God gave him the spirit and then he gave him victory in battle and he gave him success and he started believing the accolades and everybody looking up to him literally and figuratively, it started going to his head. And he started becoming proud of his accomplishments. And pretty soon he thought, I don't really need to listen to Samuel. I'm going to do it my way. And he began to disobey God's very clear commandments. And little by little, he started to grieve away the Holy Spirit. Now, real turning point for Saul was when he went out to battle with David. And David was his armor bearer at that time. At first, he loved David because he had killed Goliath. You wonder if Saul was a head and shoulders taller than everybody else, why didn't he fight Goliath? But uh, David beat Goliath, and then David began to play, play music for Saul when Saul became depressed, because now pride doesn't uh, bring you joy. It ended up making him depressed. And when they're coming back from battle, it says the women, as they often did, they come back to greet the soldiers when they were victorious, and they would sing. And they sang a song someone wrote, and the song said, Saul has slain his thousands. And Saul heard that and he swelled his chest. And yep, I like that verse. Let's sing it again. But he didn't like the second part of the verse, which said, David has slain his ten thousands. He was perfectly happy when they said Saul has slain his thousands until David got credit for slaying ten thousands. Have you ever noticed a kid will be happy if you hand them a scoop of ice cream, but if you give the one next to them a double scoop, they're not happy anymore. <laughs> because we want to be the best. Or we're jealous, and which is just a derivative of pride. I almost brought a power tool here today. I don't know if any of you men have been to, you know, Lowe's or Home Depot, and you buy these power tools. They've got a couple different brands, and they got the battery pack. They're all powered by battery. I go to Home Depot and I think I get the Roby. And you got a battery pack, you pop it in, it'll run the drill. Then you pop that battery out, you pop it in, it'll run the saw. You pop it out, you can pop it in, it'll run a headlight. It'll run a jigsaw. It's the same battery, fits all these tools. You all know what I'm talking about? And if the tool doesn't cost much, the batteries are expensive. Pride is the battery that powers just about every other vice. Jesus is, in a word, love. Jesus is God the Son. God is love. Would you all agree? Well, you have to agree with Scripture. The opposite of that is selfishness. Now, how many times does love appear in the Bible? The word. I don't know. You have to look it up and tell me. But I did look up the word selfishness. I know love is there, oh, a couple, maybe a couple hundred times. I did look up the word selfishness. How many times do you think the word selfish or selfishness is mentioned in the Bible? Four times. And every time you find the word selfish, it's a selfish ambition, all four times. Selfish ambition, all in the New Testament. That's because they didn't use that word in antiquity. The word for selfishness was often some derivative of pride. Jealousy, envy, pride, which really is the compass needle points home to yourself. Love is the needle points away to God and to others. God first made Adam and Eve where we were naturally motivated humans by love. It just was natural for us to think about others, to empathize, to think about God, to think about the creatures. 
What sin did is the devil then contaminated us with the disease that originated with him where we became naturally selfish. And we have to fight selfishness every day. It's the sin that brings down kings. When Saul heard the women say, David, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands, he was, it flipped a switch. He became obsessed. It says he eyed David from that day forward. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And it bothered him so much, it ate away at him. Now, if the Holy Spirit had been in him, he would have thought, oh, bless his heart. You know, David really, he did kill the giant. He has gone out. He's been successful. You know what Saul did? And he said, you want to marry my daughter? I want you to kill a hundred Philistines. David went out and killed 200 to make a good impression. I mean, so David really was the, you know, the ultimate warrior. And Saul should have said, good for you, and slapped him on the back. But, oh, no. Ed began to eat at him. And he got so angry that this evil spirit came over him, and David would be, be playing the harp to try to soothe Saul, and he was hurling the spear at him. He did it more than once. Matter of fact, Saul became so angry at David, he threw a spear at his own son when his son spoke up for David. And it wasn't that David had done anything wrong. Not yet. That would come later in David's life. At this point, he was being godly. He was being honest. He was being good. But just pride and jealousy was destroying Saul. Now, it is possible to get over these things. It's possible to humble yourself and get victory over pride. There are kings in the Bible that did become convicted and they did change. Saul did not. Unfortunately, to his dying day, his pride got worse and worse until it turned into demon possession. One of the final things he does is he goes to a medium to consult an evil spirit and then he falls on his sword and he kills himself. It started with pride. It is the sin that conquers kings. Now, after Saul, who's the next king? David. When you think about the sin of David, who do you think of? David and Bathsheba. But that's not where we're going. Because you already know about that. We're going somewhere else. People forget about the other big sin of David where he numbered Israel. And a plague came on the whole country. Go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles chapter 21 starts at the first verse. And it says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now who's behind this? Satan, the adversary. Why is David numbering Israel? First of all, is it wrong to count the sheep? David's a shepherd. Matter of fact, Jesus tells a parable about a shepherd that had a hundred sheep and one was missing. How did he know one was missing? He counted them. Nothing wrong with a shepherd counting its sheep. It's a bad shepherd that doesn't notice when sheep are missing. This was not about counting sheep. This was about David now saying, look at how big our kingdom is. Look at how big our army is. While we are so powerful now, it was driven by pride. I wonder how many people are in my kingdom. I wonder how many soldiers are in my army. And the spirit that was behind it was so obvious that when he made the suggestion, David says to Job the general and to the leaders of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan. Do it from the south to the north. And bring me the number that I might know it. I want to know how big my kingdom is. And when he says that, Joab answers. And Joab, he wasn't perfect. Uh, he had some good qualities, but he said, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are, but my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he bring a curse of guilt in Israel? He, he knew this was not coming from the right direction of just wanting to know how many sheep are in the flock. It was driven by pride, and even Joab said, why are you doing this? Now, why did Joab say that? Why was this wrong, especially for David? Had David ever gone into battle trusting numbers? When he went against Goliath, did he say, let me calculate who's bigger, who's got more armor, who has more munitions? He said, you're coming against me with your sword, your spear, your shield. I'm coming with the Lord. 
And so many times David went with a small force against a big force and he won because God was with him. It's like where Jonathan said to his armor bearer, there is no restraint with the Lord whether to deliver by few or many. And just Jonathan and his armor bearer defeated 20 Philistines. And so David's whole life was based on trusting God, not the numbers in the army. And Joab said, why are you doing this? David had been overcome by pride in his success. And yes, it was also pride that led to the problem with Bathsheba. You know, he got into trouble with Bathsheba. The army was out fighting and David said, I'm going to stay at home and rest instead of being with the soldiers. I've earned, I've earned some R&R. &R. He's walking on his roof in the day when the soldier's off fighting a battle. Sees his neighbor's wife. Doesn't know who she is, just knows she's beautiful. He's looking down into her courtyard as she's bathing. He gets messengers. He says, who is that woman at uh, address 666 Main Street? And... <laughs> They come back and they said, that's Bathsheba. And they finished by saying, the wife of Uriah, Uriah, your loyal soldier. And David should have said, oh, wife, sorry. You know, but not to mention, he's already got a harem at this point. I mean, how many wives do you need? I think he had 10 wives and multiple concubines at this time. And the fact that she was married, not just married, married to one of his mighty men, not just a soldier, one of his mighty men, a friend who had been through thick and thin with him. But David said, well, I'm the king. Pride. Other kings take what they want. I've earned it. Why should I be denied anything? I'm the king. I bet if I tell my servants to go get her, they'll get her. I'm the king. There was pride in there. You can count on it, friends. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The successes that Saul and David saw they began to believe that they were responsible for it. Martin Luther used to tell a story about a woodpecker that was pecking against his great big dead oak tree. And uh, just as he flew away, a thundercloud sent a clap of lightning and it struck the tree which blew it into smithereens. Well, the woodpecker wasn't hurt, but he began to screech to all of his friends, look what I did! Look what I did! And God sometimes does great things through us and we take credit for it. And he could do it without us. None of us are irreplaceable and he could do it through somebody else. God's going to accomplish his work. It's an honor and a privilege that we might be involved. David began to believe it. And you know what happened? Because he numbered Israel, going back to the first illustration, a plague went through the land. God said, All right, you're proud of the numbers? I'm going to decimate the land. You know where the word decimate comes from? It's from the word decimal, ten. It means something cut down by a tenth. If an army is decimated, it means they can lose a tenth of their soldiers. But we use the word for any kind of term of being wiped out. And, but the land was decimated by a plague because here he was trusting in how big and how populous it was. Haughty spirit goes before a fall. Now David had a son, of course he had Solomon, but he had another son named Absalom. We're going to do a little study on Absalom. He wasn't king. Well, he was briefly king, actually. If you look at uh, 2 Samuel, so Saul was proud of his size, and David was proud of his strength, and Absalom was proud of his splendor. 2 Samuel 14 it says, now in all of Israel there was no one to be praised as much as Absalom. And the word Absalom means, you know, when it says Abba, Abba means father. Paul quotes that, Abba, father. Ab means father. Shalom means peace. He had a good name, father of peace. But no one was to be praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. You know where else that is used? Job had boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot. Absalom had beauty from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. He was perfect. He would have been hired as a model by any agency. You could put him on a rotating lazy Susan, spin him around, you couldn't find anything wrong. 
And right now there's a lot of ladies out here who think, I wish I had a photograph of Absalom, right? <laughs> Just to least look and find out what does that guy look like? And it goes on to describe he had this long, luxuriant hair that must have grown very quickly because they sort of was a celebration once a year. He would cut his hair like five pounds of hair. I don't know exactly that, but I'm jealous already. But uh, he had a lot of hair. <laughs> it ends up being his downfall in the end. No one was to be praised so much as Absalom for his good looks. And he began to think and believe it all. And started thinking, you know, the people tell me how wonderful I am. He was also pretty shrewd. And it went to his head. Be careful about praising others. I think you should appreciate people. I think it's important to compliment people appropriately, to thank people. Be careful about senseless praise. You know, Proverbs says that when you praise a person, you can cast a net before their feet. And uh, when people compliment you, just be grateful, but don't take it too seriously. Uh, someone said that a compliment is sort of like perfume. Sniff, don't swallow. <laughs> right? Someone else said, many a bee has drowned in his own honey. Compliments are called artificial sweetener. So don't you praise these kids too much when they're little and they can grow up and be a real handful of pride. Is, uh, is not a good thing. You know, in the world... When we say he's a proud man, some people think that's a compliment. In the church, you realize that is not a compliment. Um, pride is stubbornness. It, it can be uh, arrogance and very unattractive. Absalom started believing it all because of his beauty and his wisdom. You know, that's how the devil fell, at least one of the reasons. If you look in Ezekiel 28, verse 12, I'll read verse 15 and 17. Listen to what Ezekiel says about Lucifer. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot. I mean, this is the most beautiful of all of God's angels. And the other angels would just adore him. And it started going to his head. What does it say in Proverbs? A beautiful woman without discretion is like a jewel of gold in a pig's nose. I didn't say it. Take it up with Solomon. That's what he said. Is there anything wrong with being beautiful? No. How many of you would like to be? You know, I remember hearing C.D. Brooks say years ago, a preacher, he said there's four kinds of people is you got people that are beautiful, ugly. What he meant by that is they're beautiful on the outside, but they know it, and because of their conceit, they're really ugly on the inside. He said, then you got people who are beautiful, beautiful. They're beautiful on the outside, and they're beautiful on the inside. They're, they're humble. And they're kind, they're like that other woman that you find in Proverbs 31. Then you got some people who are ugly beautiful. They may be a little homely on the outside, but they got a good spirit. They're listening and they got a quick smile and everyone wants to be with them even though they're not attracted necessarily by their appearance. They're beautiful people. And the worst of all is when you got ugly, ugly. Nobody wants to be that. Nobody needs to be that, right? Absalom, he began to believe it all and it destroyed him. Lucifer, perfect in beauty. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Have you ever known of somebody that because of their beauty, their hearts become lifted up? They become proud and self-centered and egotistical and... Uh, very difficult to live with. They spend all their time looking in the mirror. Uh, you know what narcissism is? Everyone talks about narcissism these days, and it's very real. Um, I think all of us have a little bit of it, but narcissist, it, it, based on a character in Greek mythology named Narcissus that 
was very beautiful, and everyone told him how beautiful he was, and one day he saw his reflection in a calm pool, and he saw himself for the first time, and he fell in love with himself. Have you met that person? And he kept staring in the pool. He could not pull himself away from his own reflection because he was so in love. He pined away and died there by the pool in love with his reflection. Be careful about uh, putting too much attention on the outward appearance and not enough on the inward. Absalom ended up, ended up rebelling against his father, tried to kill his father, killed one of his brothers. And in a battle, he fled, and he was caught by his hair that he was so proud of, hanging from a tree. And ultimately, he was murdered by Joab. It's interesting that uh, Absalom was the son of David who died hanging in a tree and uh, he was pierced with three spears. And David said, Oh, Absalom, my son, when he heard this, Absalom, my son, my son, would God I had died for thee. The very fact, he says, Would God I had died for thee. And you get the picture of the son of the king, the son of David, dying in a tree. There's uh, some images of the cross there, aren't there? So Absalom did not end well, and it was because of pride. Then you've got another king who's an interesting character study, King Uzziah. If you turn with me in your Bibles to the second book of Chronicles, we're going to read a little bit. Second Chronicles, and we'll start with, um, oh, I don't know, I might start reading the whole chapter. Yeah, let's start with verse, second Chronicles 26, verse 1. 26, verse 1. Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, I think he also has the name Ahaz, Ahaziah, they took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. And he built Elith. Now listen to all that happens. And I, just stay with me. I want you to read. This fellow had a fantastic reign. He built Elith, and he restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers, after his dad died. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years. Can you imagine having the same president 52 years? 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding and visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord God, the Lord made him prosper. Isn't that what God said to Joshua? If you follow my commandments, don't get on the right or left. I will make you prosper in the way that you go. As long as he sought the Lord, seek me with all your heart and you will find me. He prospered. Now he went out and he made war against the Philistines and he won. He broke down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jaba and the wall of Ashdod and he built cities around Ashdod among the Philistines, meaning that he fortified it so that they would never take control again. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians who lived in Gerbaal and against the Muonites. And also the Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah. And his fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. And Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem, the corner gate and the valley gate. He would have these building projects. And the corner buttress of the wall. And he fortified them. And not only did he defeat the enemy, he then fortified himself against any attack. He built towers in the desert, watchtowers. And he dug many wells. I like him. For he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. He's a man of the soil. He loved farming. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of fighting men who went out to war by companies according to the number of their role as prepared by Jael, the scribe of Masiah the officer under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The total number of chief officers, this isn't all the soldiers, the total number of chief officers of the mighty men of valor was 200,600. And under their authority was an army of 307,500. So he's a military success. He's conquering, farming, great riches, 
Then King Isaiah prepared for them the entire army shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, slings to cast stones. Not only that, he made devices. The word there is machines. He made war machines. In Jerusalem, invented by skillful men to be on the towers and on the corners to shoot arrows. Now, this goes back a long ways. You wondered about like fighting machines? King Isaiah had engineers that were building fighting machines that could throw arrows and stones long before the Romans did it. So they were pretty ingenious back then. So his fame spread far and wide for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. Success, success, following the Lord, faithful, obeying the commandments, prospering, victorious. Notice, but. You know where we're going now. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. A haughty spirit goes before a fall. Pride goes before destruction. He became proud. He started thinking, look what I have done. Is not this the great Jerusalem that I have built? And it says here, For he transgressed against the Lord God by entering the temple to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now wait a second. What's wrong with that? He's going in to worship. He's going in to burn incense. Isn't that a good thing to go to the temple of God? Uh, yeah, unless you're breaking one of the commandments. And the Bible said that only the sons of Aaron, only the priests were to enter the holy precincts of the temple and burn incense. He knew that. But as I thought, all the other kings offer sacrifice. And that was true. The kings of the other nations could always act as priests, but not with Israel. With Israel, there was a special group that God had chosen as priests, and the sons of David were to be the kings. And as I thought, well, the other nations do it. I should be able to do it. After all, everything else I've done is prospered. I can do this. But he knew what the Word of God said. He was proud. He thought, why is there a place in the kingdom I can't go, only the priests can go? I'm the king. And he started to talk to himself and think, I want to go find out what it looks like in the holy place, in the inner sanctum. He entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. You know, that's the holy place of the temple. You all understand the layout, the architecture I'm talking about? Courtyard, you could go in there. Only the priests were to go into the holy place, and only the high priest was to go into the holy of holies. He went into the holy place where only the priests were supposed to go. So Azariah, I'm in verse 17, the priest went after him. He thought, what are you doing? He grabbed a sense and walked off into the holy place. What are you doing? And this is, by the way, Solomon's temple. It's the big, glorious, beautiful building. And there were with him 80 priests of the Lord. 80 men stood up against the king, these priests. And they withstood the king. That could cost you your life. But they stood up against Isaiah and they said, It is not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall not have honor from the Lord God. Isaiah is thinking, Who do you think you are talking to me like that? You talking to me? <laughs> so I'm the king. You're telling me I got to get out? This is my kingdom. Yeah, but you're not supposed to be in here. You're breaking God's law. And Isaiah, verse 19, became furious. He thought he had, uh, he was being spiritually, had spiritual pride. And he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priests, listen here, Leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests. Usually, you know, a skin rash kind of happens slowly. You start to notice a little bit. This thing just went boom. He broke out with leprosy. Leprosy is a type of sin, isn't it, in the Bible? While they were watching, and by the way, leprosy makes you unclean, and lepers cannot enter the temple. And he broke out with leprosy on his forehead. Where does the mark of the beast show up? He broke out with leprosy in his forehead and before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the altar, the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest and all the priests looked at him and behold, on his forehead there was leprosy. 
They took the king manually because nothing unclean was supposed to be in the holy place and they grabbed the king and they tossed him out and the king himself was pretty uh, scared. It says, indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. Now you'll be happy to know that as well as we can tell from the scriptures, Isaiah repented of his sin. He had to live out the rest of his reign in a separate isolated house quarantine from the rest of the kingdom. His son did all the, of the um, face-to-face business from then on. You'll remember that Isaiah begins his book in chapter 6 by saying, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. The, they had great respect for King Isaiah. He had done many good things, but this was a real blemish, literally, on his reign. And it came from where? Pride. He started thinking, Priests can do it, I can do it. By the way, I left out this story with King Saul. Is that clock up there right? It says I got, that's, that can't be right. You guys double check the clock. I'm showing that I got four minutes. It says I got 19. Which one do you want to go by? <laughs> no, I won't keep you late. You remember King Saul? He had the same problem that Isaiah had because Samuel told Saul, you're going to go to battle against the the Philistines. Wait for me. I will come and I will offer sacrifice. Samuel was the priest in the kingdom at the time, plus the prophet, plus the judge. But he was the priest. He was from the line of Elkanah, and they were priests. And Saul said, well, Samuel's taking too long, and the Philistines are coming, and the other kings offer sacrifice. What difference does it make? If they can do it, I can do it. And it says, Saul offered sacrifice, and as soon as he finished, Samuel came. And he said, what have you done? God would have established your kingdom at this time. He said, but now your kingdom will not continue. Because of his impatience and his pride, he, he lost the kingdom. There would have been a dynasty called the dynasty of Saul, but instead it was transferred to David. Again, he thought he could do what the priests do. By the way, is there a risk that uh, we might set aside the word of God when it talks about how things should be done religiously today? Say, well, everyone else in the world does it this way. And depart from the word of God? Are we at risk for the same thing? It's already happening. So, Isaiah, he lost the kingdom when he... um, I didn't lose the kingdom. He lost his health. David was struck with a plague. Isaiah was struck. And now go to King Hezekiah. No. I changed my mind. I'm going to save that for next week. I got one more part in this series. Let me close with this. Never are you more like the devil than when you're proud. Pride is something we wrestle with every day. Every time you're selfish, you're putting yourself first. I wrestle with it. You wrestle with it. We all wrestle with it. There are two forces at war for your heart. Love and pride, selfishness. Same thing. Jesus is love embodied. The devil is the embodiment of pride. Let me read a quote to you. I said one more thing, but maybe two. This is from the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 154. The evil that led to Peter's fall, that shut out the Pharisee from communion with God, is proving the ruin of thousands today. There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it is the most hopeless, the most incurable. Because pride will not repent, which is a prerequisite to forgiveness. So often we struggle with the same attitude as the uh, the Pharisee who went to the temple and said, I thank thee, Lord, I'm not as other men. We compare ourselves among ourselves and by ourselves because of our insecurity and our pride. And by the way, insecurity, people might think, oh, they're not proud, they're insecure. That's another form of pride when you really analyze it. But if we put on Christ and the Bible says, Jesus has come to me, I am meek and lowly and you will find rest. You know what that means? 
When you humble yourself, you find peace and rest. Proud people are troubled. They're not satisfied. Like Saul, they're, they're plagued because they're worried about everybody else. Where when you humble yourself, you, you find this peace. He said, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. You will find peace and rest. Happiness comes from putting God first. You know what the, um, the message is? Fear God and give glory to him. Give glory to him. The devil wants us to take glory for ourselves. The devil wanted to be glorified. He said, Jesus, if you just worship me, our happiness is going to come from praising and glorifying God, friends. Amen. And that's where you're going to find peace. We are made to give glory to God. Two reasons you're alive. To know God, his love, give glory to him, and to share God's love and glory with others. And we're going to sing about praising the Lord. I thought that'd be a good way. This is often a song we use for opening our church service. We're going to close our service praising God. Amen? Let's stand together as we sing.